And what makes it so difficult to absorb many of the vitamins and minerals found in plants is that plants also contain something called anti-nutrients. This can range from phytates to lectins to oxalates to tannins. Here are three healthy foods that are actually harming you. Number one, spinach. Spinach is a leaf. Leaves are full of defense chemicals that are harmful for you in many ways. This is very high in oxalates, compounds which are well known to contribute to kidney stones, joint pain, gut issues, all sorts of problems. Spinach is not a health food. Oatmeal. Oats are full of phytic acid. Hey friends, welcome back. In today's show, we're going to talk about minimizing anti-nutrients in your food from plants, grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes. Hey guys, today we're going to talk about anti-nutrients in vegetables and other foods. Hey, what is going on guys? So if you've spent even just a small amount of time in the nutrition, vegan, anti-vegan, or carnivore sphere online, you may have heard some people, especially anti-vegans and carnivores, fear monger over anti-nutrients in plants. Some of these anti-nutrients are known as lectins, oxalates, phytates, goitrogens, phytoestrogens, and tannins. Now, the degree to which these anti-nutrients are fear-mongered over online will depend on the fear-mongerer in question. Some of these fear-mongerers think that, you know, plants are all trying to kill us and they justify this claim by pointing to the existence of these anti-nutrients. Some fear-mongerers will point to these anti-nutrients as evidence that fruits and vegetables just aren't good for us. And some will point to these anti-nutrients to justify the claim that, yeah, you know, fruits and vegetables have a lot of nutrients, but because of these anti-nutrients, you're not actually absorbing all the nutrients in there or as much as you would need to thrive. And at least from what I've seen, the people who fear monger over these nutrients rarely ever discuss the huge amount of health outcome data we have suggesting that the foods which contain these anti-nutrients may actually be health promoting. The basic question I have is if anti-nutrients are such a problem, why does data suggest that consuming foods high in these anti-nutrients is actually good for health. Well, outside of these anti-nutrients, micronutrients, and macronutrients found in plant-based foods, there are also a large amount of bioactive plant compounds. And there is research to suggest that the reduction in chronic disease we see from high intake of plant-based foods may be attributed to the synergistic effects of anti-inflammatory phytochemicals found in plant foods, such as polyphenols, alkaloids, carotenoids, organosulfur compounds, terpenoids, and phytosterols. And from this narrative review on anti-nutrients, which by the way, I'm gonna be using as a primary source for this video, due to the diverse and complex interactions of vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals in a single food, health effects of a whole food or a combination of foods will likely be significantly different than that of isolated compounds. To complicate research even further, interaction of phytochemicals and microbiota within the intestinal environment could alter both bioavailability and biological effects. For these reasons, elucidating the physiological effects of individual plant components obtained through dietary sources composed of thousands of different compounds is an implausible task. The point is people are not consuming lectins, oxalates, phytates, and other anti-nutrients alone. They're consuming foods that yes, contain these anti-nutrients, but also many phytochemicals. And because of this, rather than looking at research studying these anti-nutrients in isolation, we should be looking at health outcome data in humans who consume foods that yes, contain some of these anti-nutrients, but also contain many different phytochemicals that may be partially responsible for the positive health outcomes we see from the consumption of whole plant-based foods. Now we'll probably look at both in this video, but I just wanted to make that clear. We'll also be looking into how the processing of certain anti-nutrient filled foods could actually lower the concentration of anti-nutrients in particular foods. In summary, we're going to be covering lectins, oxalates, phytates, goitrogens, phytoestrogens, and tannins. Let's now begin with lectins. Lectins are a diverse family of carbohydrate binding proteins found in almost all organisms, including plants, animals, and microorganisms. They can be found in legumes, seeds, nuts, fruits, and vegetables. You won't find a significant amount of lectins in unprocessed fruits and vegetables, but you will find this in raw legumes and whole grains. Lectins can be removed from foods by various processes. Soaking, autoclaving, and boiling can cause irreversible lectin denaturation. In fact, boiling legumes for one hour at 95 degrees Celsius has been found to reduce lectin activity by around 93 to 99%. And the good news is, most people don't consume their legumes raw. Amazing. Unfortunately, there have been cases of food poisoning involving raw or insufficiently cooked legumes. So yeah, 
don't eat your legumes raw and try to prepare them correctly. There have been animal studies showing high doses of isolated legume lectins and raw legume flowers can impair the integrity of the intestinal mucosa by inducing intestinal hyperplasia. This change in intestinal integrity resulted in compromised nutrient absorption, especially for protein, lipids, and B12. This also led to reduced growth of the experimental animals. Now keep in mind, these studies were not just on animals, but they also included isolated legume lectins and raw legume flour. Clinical human trials using whole cooked beans do not exhibit the same effects we saw in these in vitro or in vivo animal models, which use isolated lectins and raw bean flours. Put simply, studies on lectins which rely on animal models, cell cultures, and isolated lectins do not simulate real-world scenarios where lectins are consumed in small amounts with combinations of other foods and their bioactive components. So the basic thing to take away from this is that yes, lectin-rich foods can lead to food poisoning if you don't prepare your food properly. So prepare your food properly. Crazy. Legumes and other lectin-rich foods can be a great source of protein, prebiotic fibers, vitamins, minerals, and antioxidant and anti-inflammatory compounds. And it is no wonder that diets rich in legumes and whole grains are associated with reduced inflammatory biomarkers in both animal and human trials. Let's now move on to oxalates. Oxalate or oxalic acid is a substance that can form insoluble salts with minerals including sodium, potassium, calcium, iron, and magnesium. Some plant foods with the highest amount of oxalate content are spinach, Swiss chard, amaranth, taro, sweet potatoes, beets, rhubarb, and sorrel. Raw legumes, whole grains, nuts, and baking cocoa also contain oxalate, but in small amounts. A distinction should be made between total oxalate content, which is soluble or insoluble, mainly because excess soluble oxalate can have more of an effect on bioavailability and kidney stone formation. Similar to lectins, the preparation process of oxalate-rich foods can have an effect on the oxalate concentration within foods and hence mineral availability in food items. Wet processing methods such as boiling and steaming seem to be the most efficient ways to reduce oxalate content. When it comes to legumes, soaking, boiling, or autoclaving can significantly reduce total and soluble oxalate content. Microwaving legumes is even an option for reducing oxalates in them. And aside from cooking, pairing high oxalate foods with calcium-rich foods may offset soluble oxalate absorption. According to this randomized trial, a diet including an average of 1200 milligrams of calcium and 200 milligrams of oxalate per day was shown to be more effective than a diet of no more than 400 milligrams of calcium per day and low oxalate foods for the prevention of recurrent stones in men with idiopathic hypercalceria. Now, oxalates are thought to play a role in hyperoxaluria, which is a risk factor for the formation of calcium oxalate kidney stones. And a study of 20 healthy men and women found that an oxalate-rich diet of 600 milligrams per day from rhubarb juice significantly increased urinary excretion from 0.354 to 0.542 millimoles per 24 hours. However, oxalate is not typically consumed every day in such a concentrated form as rhubarb juice, but is instead a small fragment in an intricate web of dietary factors. There was a perspective analysis from the Nurses Health Study concluding that dietary oxalate is not a major risk factor for stone formation. And a more recent analysis of the Nurses Health Study found that dietary oxalate had little impact on kidney stone formation. Now, referring back to the general theme that I want all of you to understand in this video, these anti-nutrients are not consumed in isolation. Despite significantly more dietary oxalates, which is about 254 milligrams per day, and oxalate containing foods such as nuts, vegetables, and whole grains, participants with higher DASH scores have a 40 to 50 percent decreased risk of kidney stones. This is perhaps attributed to the protective and synergistic effects of phytate, potassium, calcium, and other phytochemicals all abundant in the DASH dietary pattern. Similar findings regarding the protective role of vegetables and urolithiasis risk were reported in this paper. There are some people who may benefit from reduced oxalate intake, for example, people with inflammatory bowel disease like myself who have been shown to be at a higher risk for calcium oxalate kidney stones which may be caused by oxalate hyperabsorption. And here's something interesting. Animal protein consumption has been associated with a higher risk of kidney stones while tea which is a rich source of oxalate, is associated with a lower risk of kidney stone formation. It is believed that the polyphenols and the antioxidant phytochemicals found in tea may be responsible for the prevention of kidney stone formation. To summarize everything here, there may be certain segments of the population who should limit their oxalate intake, but generally speaking, appropriately preparing oxalate-rich foods can largely reduce the amount of oxalates in foods high in oxalates. Maybe just don't consume bags of raw spinach at a time while also consuming very low amounts of calcium per day. And lastly, oxalate-containing foods can possess an array of protective and beneficial compounds, which may outweigh the possible negative effects of oxalate. Let's now move on to goitrogens. The term goitrogen refers to agents that can negatively impact thyroid function and thus increase the risk of goiter and other thyroid diseases. Kale and Brussels sprouts are considered foods with high concentrations of goitrogens. Similar to oxalates and lectins, processing can have an effect on the goitrogen content of foods. The cooking and fermenting of foods may lower total goitrogen concentration, but it should be mentioned that cooking can also remove beneficial goitrogens. When it comes 
to human studies, there is one that assessed radioactive iodine uptake following Gortrin administration and found that 25 milligrams of recrystallized Gortrin decreased iodine uptake, though 10 milligrams resulted in no inhibition. These results, however, cannot be extrapolated for human health as they are not representative of a balanced diet. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of studies investigating the effects of dietary Gortrogens on people. There is evidence supporting an association between Gortrogen containing foods and thyroid dysfunction, but this association was only found mostly in the presence of low iodine intake. While there is just a small amount of epidemiological studies showing potential concern for somebody consuming dietary gorgogens in combination with low iodine, other human studies have shown no concerns. In a three-year trial of genistine, which is considered an isoflavone gorgogen, no impacts on thyroid function or health were observed. A review on soy isoflavones arrived at similar conclusions, but still advised soy-consuming individuals taking thyroid medication to increase their dosage of thyroid medication due to the possibility of decreased drug absorption. To be safe, people definitely should just be getting their iodine into optimal levels, but especially if they're going to be consuming goitrogen-rich foods on the regular. Taking an iodine supplement or cooking goitrogen-rich foods with iodized salt seems like a good idea here. All right, let's now move on to phytoestrogens. Phytoestrogens are plant-derived polyphenolic dietary compounds with structural similarities to estradiol, the primary sex hormone in females. As us vegans know, phytoestrogens are very often conflated with mammalian estrogens because people see the word estrogen and phytoestrogen and all of a sudden think we're talking about the hormone estrogen that we see in females. Isoflavones and lignins are two of the four phenolic compounds that phytoestrogens are classified into. For the purposes of this video, these are the two we're gonna be focusing on here because those are the two that people mainly fear monger about online. Whole soybeans, soy nuts, tofu, tempeh, soy milk, and miso soup are some of the examples of higher isoflavone foods. Flax seeds and sesame seeds are reported to contain the greatest amount of lignins. Now back to isoflavones. Flavones. A systematic review and meta-analysis concluded that isoflavones have no effect on endometrial thickness or breast density. Now, what about these phytoestrogens' effects on hormones? Another meta-analysis of pre- and post-menopausal women found in pre-menopausal women, soy isoflavone consumption had no effect on circulating estradiol, estrone, or sex hormone binding globulin. And this meta-analysis of clinical studies showed no effects of soy protein or isoflavones on reproductive hormones in men. Now, there is much more health outcome data that was listed in this review on anti-nutrients, but to prevent the video from being so long, I'll have a screenshot of it here if you want to read. But here is the conclusion on the section of the paper covering phytoestrogens. Overall, the evidence surrounding phytoestrogens within the currently published literature is still mixed, with a large amount of heterogeneity between studies. The microbial makeup of the gut, bioindividuality, and the phytoestrogen source all play a significant role in the decision to include phytoestrogen-rich food in one's diet. Supplementation using isolated isoflavones may be beneficial for some populations, but may pose increased risk for others. Babies and infants are at a higher risk of endocrine-disrupting potential because of their small size and underdeveloped digestive tract. With that said, Epidemiological and observational data suggest that including phytoestrogen-rich foods as part of a varied plant-based diet should not be of concern, but may be beneficial. Additionally, phytoestrogen-containing foods such as legumes, grains, seeds, nuts, fruits, and vegetables are rich sources of essential vitamins, minerals, fiber, and other health-promoting phytochemicals. Let's now move on to phytates. Phytates, which are also known as phytic acid, is another commonly fear-mongered anti-nutrient. It is found in many plant foods with the highest amounts in cereals, legumes, nuts, seeds, and pseudo-cereals. The main fear with phytates I see online is that they may reduce absorption of minerals like calcium, zinc, and iron. As with the previously mentioned anti-nutrients, processing techniques such as soaking, fermentation, sprouting, germinating, and cooking can significantly alter phytate content in grains and legumes, allowing for increased mineral availability. Cooking legumes for one hour at 95 degrees Celsius led to a 23% loss in yellow split peas, a 20 to 80% loss in lentils, and an 11% loss in chickpeas, but only a marginal reduction of 0.29% in black beans. Soaking seeds in fresh water can reduce phytate values in millet, maize, rice, and soybean beans by 28, 21, 17, and 23 percent respectively. And although soaking can reduce phytates, it can also result in losses of iron and zinc. For this reason, soaking cannot be said to lower the seeds phytate to iron ratio. This mineral loss could partially be mitigated by cooking rice in the soaking water as the seeds will recover the leached minerals. For other preparation methods that may reduce phytate content, read this section of the review. Now on to some health outcome data straight from the review. Many studies support the hypothesis that phytate negatively impacts zinc bioavailability. However, a study on young children aged 8 to 50 months found phytates to not have a discernible effect on zinc absorption. An increase of 500 milligrams per day of dietary phytate led to less than a 0.04 milligram per day reduction in zinc absorption. The largest variance in absorption rates occurred based on age, height, and weight. The relationship between dietary phytate and iron bioavailability may be more complex than that of zinc. Even after the removal of 90% 
40% of IP6 in sorghum flour through phytase treatment, no improvement in iron bioavailability was observed. And there is this randomized control trial that has shown that regular consumption of a high phytate diet reduces the inhibitory effect of phytate on non-heme iron absorption in women with suboptimal iron stores. And something that can be added to meals high in phytic acid are complementary foods high in vitamin C, which has been shown to increase iron absorption. And as discussed before, we have plenty of health outcome data associating the consumption of foods high in phytic acid with positive health outcomes. So this anti-nutrient doesn't seem to be much of an issue in the context of an overall healthy diet. This seems to be the pattern we're seeing with all of these supposed anti-nutrients. Lastly, let's cover tannins. Tannins are a broad class of polyphenol compounds of high molecular weight. They're commonly present in plant foods and are responsible for the taste of many fruits and beverages. They're found in cocoa beans, tea, wines, fruits, juices, nuts, seeds, legumes, and cereal grains. Cooking and processing foods can have a substantial effect on the amount of tannins in certain foods, However, many tannin-rich foods are typically consumed raw, like fruits. Some researchers have deemed tannins to be an anti-nutrient due to its ability to potentially inhibit iron absorption. Some animal studies have supported this, but animal studies using condensed tannins, which are more commonly found in the human diet, have not found any significant impact on iron status. Well, what about human health outcomes? The dosages in the previously mentioned animal studies are far greater than regular consumption of tannins through a balanced diet. Delamont and colleagues found that four weeks of condensed tannin supplementation with 1.5 0.35 and 0.03 grams three times per day had no impact on iron bioavailability or status in premenopausal women. Tea, one of the richest sources of dietary tannins, may inhibit iron absorption when consumed directly with a non-heme iron rich meal. In a study of healthy adults, iron absorption was decreased by 37% when tea was consumed with an iron fortified porridge. However, this didn't happen when the tea was consumed an hour after the meal. Other factors such as gender and baseline iron status may also influence the impact of tannins on iron parameters. In a study investigating the effects of green and black tea on iron status of omnivores and vegetarians, one liter of black tea per day for four weeks with meals resulted in significantly lower ferritin levels only in omnivorous females, but no effects were observed in omnivorous males. Green tea had no influence on ferritin levels in omnivorous and vegetarian in females, and in females with low baseline ferritin, both green and black tea significantly reduce ferritin levels. Similar to phytic acid, including vitamin C rich foods with the consumption of tannins could help reduce the inhibitory effect when it comes to iron. And similar to all of the anti-nutrients discussed in this video, tannins are not consumed alone, but in combination with thousands of other bioactives. This might explain why studies investigating a correlation between dietary intake of tannins and iron deficiency are unable to find one. And finding correlations like this is important when somebody is trying to fear monger over something like tannins. If there is a worry about tannins, for example, inhibiting iron absorption to a problematic degree, we should find a correlation between increased tannin intake and iron deficiency, but we don't. All right, guys, so I wanna end this video by reading the conclusion of the review that largely guided this video. Straight from the review, the purpose of this review was to assess whether there is considerable clinical data to warrant certain compounds and plants to be positioned as anti-nutrients in the sense that they block the absorption or assimilation of essential nutrients or in some way interfere with the physiological function of an organ. The summary of our findings would suggest the following. Of the compounds reviewed, there are indications that when given in the diet in what would be considered moderate to high quantities or when administered in isolation, they may exert effects that would be detrimental or impair the body's reserved or function in some way. There may be some individuals who are more susceptible to these effects for various reasons. These compounds are rarely ingested in their isolated format as we know from how these foods are traditionally consumed. Plant-based diets which contain these compounds also contain thousands of other compounds in the food matrix, many of which counteract the potential effects of the quote, anti-nutrients. Therefore, it remains questionable as to whether these compounds are as potentially harmful as they might seem to be in isolation, as they may act differently when taken in within whole foods that are properly prepared. Cooking and application of heat seems to be essential for the activation of some of these compounds. In some cases, what has been referred to as anti-nutrients may in fact be therapeutic agents for various conditions. More exploration and research are required to know for certain. Now, there is a lot in this review that I did not cover in this video, both in favor and not in favor of these anti-nutrients. So I highly recommend you give the review your own read if interested. It is very thorough. But the overall conclusion is what you just heard. Anti-nutrients don't seem to be as terrifying as carnivores and anti-vegans online make them out to be. All right, guys, that's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. Please send this video to somebody who fear mongers to you about anti-nutrients, just so they understand that there's a lot of nuance when it comes to this. And it's not as simple as plants are trying to kill us and plants and vegetables and fruits and vegetables and all that are just unhealthy, etc. Thank you so much for watching. If you support my work and want to get early access to it, you can click the link in the pinned comment and support me on Patreon. And if you don't know, I do have a book going over most, if not all, of the anti-vegan arguments you're going to hear online. If you want to get that as well, that'll be linked in the pinned comment. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Dude, fuck off. I don't want anything to do with you. Don't ever speak to me again. You're a fucking piece of shit. Even vegans don't get your weird stuff.
stupid wannabe sense of irony here. Who is your audience? Nobody gets these dumb jokes. Dude, 